any time you like. Yeah, I'm ready. It's uh, it's perfect timing, I guess. We are we are just two minutes ahead. Let us okay. let us just wait for two minutes so everyone yes. is on board. Okay. So let me take I've, this a chance. To I've just me. I've been just I've been just uh, in a hospital today. I was dealing with a lady who is suffering from the cancer in her pelvis, and she developed a massive activity of her right lower limb. And I was I was working on her since yesterday by thrombolysis Excellent. because it was because it was three weeks already. So I usually start with thrombolysis to macerate the thrombus. And today we finish it with a mechanical thrombectomy and successful stenting. And she improved on table. It was, it's amazing. You know, these venous procedures are so gratifying, unlike arterial cases. Excellent. That's very good. We can also include uh, this case at the presentation if you have time. Yeah, at least for discussion for sure. Okay. So let me introduce you to the uh, 11 participants uh, that we have. They are part of the Egyptian uh, Vascular Fellowship Program. Uh, they are uh, young vascular surgeon. Uh, they, uh, they heard about you and your unit in Bahrain quite a lot. And uh, they are very eager to uh, see your lecture and to uh, discuss cases with you. Professor Martin Marish is one of the most eminent vascular surgeons in the Middle East. He works in Bahrain and uh, he has uh, arterial and venous interest. He is also an examiner in the European Board of Vascular Fellowship. So you can also uh, ask him a question about this. And uh, we have now uh, 15 members. If you like to start your lecture, uh, anytime we are ready, Professor Martin. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, I would like to, to thank you and, uh, and, you know, to, to thank you not for on, only for this lecture, but uh, I would like to thank you for your effort in, in educational activities in general. I guess the great country of Egypt is blessed by the people like you. <laughs> that is but, very uh, good I, I, I know you don't like to talk about this too much, so I have skipped this and uh, and uh, I just welcome all these 15 participants. It's, it's uh, good for all of us to be on board on this educational platform. Okay. This is just, a, this is just an initial lecture there is a lot. Uh, there is a lot to talk about. It's. Uh, I hope this is just a beginning of uh, of regional cooperation and educational cooperation because I guess it's important to create the the the, the common platform in in vascular surgical education. And I guess we all, all agree on this. So this is just a small part of it, and the initial part. And I guess your or our uh, young fellows, they will carry on this, this message and, and after a couple of years, they will be educating us, inshallah. inshallah. Uh, so if you, if you don't mind, Mohammed, I will start uh, discussing the, the Venus reconstruction. It's, uh, it's a topic which is very close to my heart. It's, uh, and uh, I feel obliged to, to push further in this, in this regard because you know, we left venous, venous pathologies and venous disorders alone for a long time, unfortunately. And uh, I like this, I like this topic because it describes perfectly the evolution of the, and dynamic of the vascular surgery as a specialty. And uh, I don't think so, there is many specialties like ours, and we are really blessed, you know, to be a vascular surgeon these days is very exciting and uh, and uh, it's amazing how how dynamic and how broad is is the spectrum of our interventions perhaps only cardiology the interventional cardiology can be compared to, to our specialty and uh, it's perhaps not not the, the evolution but it's the revolution because i i graduated in 1996 and I started my career straight away as a cardiovascular surgeon, and I was very typical surgeon with a very long knife. But uh, 
so during the, the my career and, uh, and after the fellowship, I found out that there is much more than the knife in, uh, in favor of our patient, and I, I started to be interested in the in the virus and the balloons in early 2000 2002 mm -hmm. and i left to italy to to learn more about it and and there is really funny history about it because when i went to my professor in uh, Bratislava and i told him that i'm interested in, in wires and balloons he said like martin you are a surgeon you need you need a long knife and not the balloons balloons look balloons are for children i mean but you know unfortunately or fortunately for us the balloons are not only for children and, and we can use them successfully to, to treat our patients uh, of course not these balloons but pt balloons and it's amazing how how many pathologies uh, can be remotely ta uh, targeted and treated uh, nowadays and uh, the venus the venus pathology is an amazing example of of change in our practice because you are very young but you don't remember well but uh, when i started in 90s the only venous procedure basically was a varicose vein surgery and even even chronic venous insufficiency as a as a as a, as a, as a venous disorder was not very well understood that the days you know it was like because there is no disease is varicose veins. Varicose veins is not disease of the veins. The varicose veins are just a consequence of some uh, underlying pathology. And it's very important to recognize this pathology. And, and uh, for many years, we used to just remove, keep removing the varicose veins. And then the patients were coming back in, in disappointment in a way. And, uh, and even chronic venous insufficiency is uh, understood in a different way nowadays, and we are changing the chapters about varicose veins. And, and I don't think so. There is we're supposed to name the, the chapter in our book varicose veins because it's not a disease; it's just a consequence of, of the problems. And, uh, and uh, deep in strong bosis as a disorder was always left alone for the medical. You know the so whenever there was a DVT patient, the patient was put on warfarin by the medical, managed by the medical, and the surgeon was left sleeping in a corner. You know, no one even rang the surgeon. But uh, this has changed uh, a lot, and the surgeons should be involved. Uh, five years back, I opened the, the Venus Center in our hospital. We have, you know, we have opened the. And, uh, and announced the, the Venus uh, Center, and, and we, we became much more involved in the Venus pathology, and we encourage all our uh, other colleagues from the emergency, from the medical, from the hematology, from GP, and uh, I did a lot. I, I did. I put a lot of effort to discuss all, with all of them and encourage them to refer all the patients. All the patients suffering from DVT to be referred to our our service, it actually put a lot of uh, headache on our shoulders because, of course, they are referring all the patients with DVT, and not all the patients are candidates for the invasive procedure. But but we pay this price to be familiar with these patients and to see them all because it's the vascular intervention. Is a vascular surgeon should be the one. Who decide, who decides about the about the management, and it shouldn't be the medical. And if you decide to go for anticoagulation alone, then it can be the medical specialist to deal with it. But the initial in, uh, indication should be done by the by the vascular specialist or vascular interventionist or vascular surgeon. And uh, the sleeping surgeon, supposed not to be sleeping anymore. This is. Uh, this is a picture of the very path and the future is completely different and that's why we are all here and we are going to discuss it. I believe you can, you can ask the questions uh, during the... Uh, you can interrupt me at any point or any moment or you can write your, your questions uh, in a chat. We can, we can open the floor to the question if if anyone have a question, he can uh, 
press on raise his hand and then we can take uh, questions. If not, you can proceed. Or, or if, you, if you don't mind, after each kind of chapter, when I feel that we uh, finish the, the, some kind of uh, compact chapter in, in, the, in the lecture, we can stop for a while. And if there is any lecture, then we can all discuss it because this is supposed not to be a uh, lecture in the evening, it's supposed to be a discussion. And uh, Dr. Mohammed he put this lecture as a secret of, uh, of Basquar interventions that I can tell you from the beginning that there will be a lot of secrets uh, which uh, will keep uh, hidden from us even after this because there is a lot of, lot of questions in the Venus procedures and we will get there. Uh, there, is some, uh, there is some comments, Martin, that uh, they want you to increase your voice a little bit, if you can. Yeah, of course I will try to shout. These, okay. are the, these are the numbers which you all are familiar with. This is not that important for the, uh, for the audience like you. These are, these are the numbers there, you know, which show just the importance of this, of, of uh, interest in, in the management of the because in general the DVT is extremely serious uh, uh, disorder and it's a it's a disorder which is very very common and it's common in a hospital you know the most risky patients are already admitted in a hospital usually not coming from outside that's why they all are on prophylaxis and we have to follow them up and the incidence is increasing because the population is getting older and sicker and more obese and not really moving so all the risk factors are getting more and more prevalent and that's why uh, we will encounter this uh, disease more and more and we have to we have to be familiar with the with the proper management you know in Bahrain it should be about 1500 patients every year with uh, diagnosed with DVT unfortunately many of them are missed and majority of them are are uh, uh, not managed properly, especially the one with the, with the proximal disease. These are the numbers I've got from, from, the, from Saudi, from my friend Dr. Faha, uh, and uh, they found out that uh, in hospital uh, mortality uh, from the from the from the DET is about 10 to 12 percent. So each Ten patients uh, can die from from DVT, and around ten uh, one percent of all hospital admissions die from the pulmonary embolism. Palm pulmonary embolism is linked to the DVT, and we'll be discussing pulmonary embolism and its management as well. This is perhaps the most important uh, algorithm. This is the, the basic uh, algorithm of the management of the DVT. So after, after uh, establishing the diagnosis of DVT, usually by the ultrasound, uh, the patient started an anticoagulation, usually with a heparin. Uh, there is a some per very small percentage of the patients contraindicated to the anticoagulation, and these patients might be indicated for the IVC, and we'll discuss the IVC filtering insertion further. And then the most important is to, that's why the ultrasound is extremely important and I want to encourage all our colleagues, young colleagues and fellows to get uh, involved with the radiologists and to learn the ultrasound by themselves because ultrasound is an amazing uh, diagnostic tool. It's, it's readily available all the time. You know, my colleagues, despite being senior consultant, I don't mind pushing ultrasound here and there myself because I like to have ultrasound on my side all the time. And they call me ice cream men, you know, and they are laughing. But uh, the trick of the ultrasound is non-invasive. There is no radiation, no contrast involved. And uh, uh, the only trick about ultrasound is that it's uh, oper operator dependent. And what it means is that all your management depends on the ultrasound, you know, on the result of the ultrasound. If you let the radiologist to do that, for the radiologist, it's a headache. It's just one extra case. He's already having 50 patients waiting for him. 
and he wants to get it done as soon as possible. And uh, you know, it's not his personal interest to get it. He wants to get it done as soon as possible. But for you, your management is vitally dependent on the result of the ultrasound. So uh, the message is, do ultrasound yourself and do it perfectly. And, and it's extremely important to find out where exactly is the thrombosis, uh, the extent of the thrombosis, and probably even to identify how old is the thrombosis, this is all you can get from the ultrasound itself. Because there is a big difference in the management between the distal, which is called vein uh, thrombosis, and the proximal uh, DVT. Proximal, we call iliofemoral DVT. So in the region about the, the, the popliteal. The next slide is, uh, you know, the next slide belongs to IVC filter, and it's my it's my cordial issue because uh, I believe 80% of IVC filters are inserted unnecessarily, and <coughs> we can discuss this in a, in a different platform sometimes uh, sometimes later. But uh, you know the. Absolute contraindication to thrombolysis or thrombectomy is uh, is very questionable, and we can discuss this. The problem of IVC filter, and I have to put it straight, and I can afford this because we are 30 of vascular surgeons, I believe. And the problem of IVC filter insertion is that it's so it's usually very simple technical then technique. It's uh, it's very fast. It usually doesn't take more than half an hour. And it's very well paid procedure, you know. That's why the radiologists and the cardiologists and, and interventionists they love inserting the, the the IVC. And it's kind. It's not only that. It's not only about the money. It's also about the false, uh, you know, counting ourselves. It's it's like it's it works as a placebo for the physicians. They say like, okay, I'll come to love you put the IVC filter, and we are, you know, we decrease the risk and it's in favor of patients well, but it's not really because you know they keep saying about uh, about uh, the IVC filters to be to be there only for a certain period of time. But unfortunately, it's not the truth because the uh, vast majority of the of IVC filters be there forever. Even they they are inserted as a retrievable uh, filters. That 80 percent, and it's it's from the studies. They stay in the patients. They stayed in the IVC for a long time, and then it's very difficult to remove them after a year or so. And it's because these patients are getting lost, or the primary physician has, has forgotten that the patient is having filter, or patient is discharged, or patient is uh, you know transferred elsewhere. And uh, and even IVC filters, which are inserted as uh, retrievable, are are basically permanent and as you can imagine you know having a piece of wires in the IVC is definitely not something you you want to have yourself or, or you don't want your patients having it so be very wise and think twice about the IVC filter insertion because because the indications are quite strict and and, and many of these filters are inserted unnecessarily and uh, I've seen many patients with with the complications and it's sometimes very difficult to remove the filter and you can do a lot of harm by trying to, to remove the IVC filter which is causing the secondary DVT of the IVC sometimes reaching all the way up to the head of the veins. So, <clears throat> uh, let's discuss the distal DVT. The distal DVT means below the knee, the crural veins or tibial veins DVT. It's very common, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, extremely common. It's usually clinically much less dramatic than proximal disease, uh, but it doesn't mean it cannot co cause the complications. You know, about 40% of pulmonary embolism is, uh, is coming from tibial veins. It's, not, it's usually not massive, but they can embolize. So you have to treat these patients. What is important, you don't need to admit them in a hospital. And nowadays, the, there is a trend not to admit them, to let them walk around, put the compression stopping start, anticoagulation, which is the most important. 
<coughs> the length of the anticoagulation, of course, depends on the cause of the thrombosis. <coughs> and you can manage them as outpatients. Uh, the best practice is to put them on low molecular weight heparins and, uh, and you check them by the ultrasound in six weeks and three months. You ask them to walk and you put the compression stockings. Uh, this is the diagram of the initial anticoagulation. And then uh, <laughs> you can uh, you can ship them on one of the new or anticoagulants, and it's up to you. This uh, these studies and randomized trials are still ongoing. It's not very clear. It's not very clear for myself, to be honest. I had a couple of patients on dabigantra and rinoroxaban, apixaban, but the uh, vast majority of my venous patients are working on warfarin only, and I believe in warfarin still. It's it's easy to it's easy to manage the bleeding complications, unlike uh, unlike new oral anticoagulants. And I've seen two or three fatal bleedings of rivaroxaban, and I'm very cautious of putting the patients on, on new oral anticoagulants. I do this only in a case that it's, let's say, very old patient, not, not able to manage warfarin or not, you know, some patients, they just don't cope with the doses, so you have to change the doses of warfarin very often. So this is, to me, indication, indications to, uh, to NOAC, uh, but I, I am not very much in favor in, in the venous disease. You know, we have a lot of studies with uh, AF patients, but we don't have many patients, many studies with, uh, with DVT patients. <clears throat> so let's get back to this, to this initial uh, management algorithm. And this is the, our target group at the patients uh, with a proximal disease, with the iliofemoral uh, thrombosis. So you have a patient who is usually uh, suffering from edema and, and painful swelling of the lower limb. You do the ultrasound, you find dilated uncompressible vein, which is the sign, ultrasound sign of DVT. And uh, you detect no flow there. It's very important to, to uh, keep investigating proximal and distal. Proximal, you need to know how far to go. Usually you find that the thrombosis of the iliac vein and that's enough for you to indicate a more aggressive approach. The distal is good to finalize the, the diagnostic process so you can, you can identify your entry vein, entry vein and it, the, the most common is a fetal vein. But uh, in many patients, I, I just uh, introduce my sheet in the tibial vein, you see the dorsalis pedis vein or, or posterior tibial vein. Uh, it depends on how far distally the thrombosis is extended. The, the secret of the, of the proper access is extremely important. Is, this is one of the first, this is one of the first uh, secrets I can share with you. Uh, the femoral is never, never go. For, the, for any DVT, the femoral is extremely rare to puncture. You know, it's, uh, because there is always extended uh, distally. So you can go for popliteal excess, which is good excess because popliteal vein is very huge and, and it's very easy to, to access it. And you can either put the patient to, to prone position, uh, but the best way is to access the popliteal vein and then put the patient into supine leg again. Don't do all the procedure on prone because prone position <laughs> it's very difficult to manage in case you need to access the contralateral side or in case you need the jugular access and you need to get an access from, from up, from, from proximal side. And, and it's quite common. So what I do, I insert usually the micropuncture in the room under ultrasound on, on the bedside. And then while the patient is transferred to the angio suite or the operating theater, then we put the patient in supine and just and just over the wire change the micropuncture to the big size sheet because keep on mind that you know all this uh, all this uh, uh, whatever you will need the, the machines and stands and balloons 
everything is very big in veins. So uh, you don't never start with a small sheet because you will end up with eight French or a 10 French sheet for sure. Because all the NGO, NGOJET catheters and, and Aspirex catheters and uh, Atlas balloons, it's all eight, eight, nine, 10 and 11 French. Okay, so don't, don't be scared about the size. In veins, everything is big. We are discussing. I think, I think this is very important point that the femoral puncture for uh, deep venous intervention is, is not a good access site at all. Um, almost, almost never. For the femoral access yeah. is reserved only on, for the very specific patients when yeah. you usually already know the pathology. I do sometimes femoral if I know it's like pure mater nursing syndrome, post thrombosis already, lysis or you know compression syndromes but but tbt i never punctured the femoral it's always popliteal or even tibial because yeah. the tibial veins can can uh, can easily take the the eight french sheet so it's not a big deal yeah have you used professor martin the mid thigh approach to deep femoral vein because the problem with the popliteal is that you have to make the patient prone anesthetist usually doesn't like that and to shift him again. Did you patients, 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 patients with DVT. Yeah, yeah. The, no, I don't like it because patients with DVT are having always a swollen limb. You know, it's uh, so you have to go very deep. You have to go to the swollen limb. Okay. And uh, for me, it's much easier to 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 access the tibial if, if the patient is obese and if there is problem because there are patients they cannot tolerate prone position and I have these patients. In okay. this case, I access the tibial veins, or I, <clears throat> or I access in standing position. I make the patient stand up. I get the, I get get the micropuncture because micropuncture is very simple and easy. You know, even if you, you can play around with it, if you don't get an access, it's not a big deal. It's not a big needle. You know, it's not a big bleeding. So either tibial veins or standing position in popliteal, but the mid thigh vein, it's very very deep. The, all these patients are swollen. No, this is not my. Okay. This is not a virgin. virgin okay. no. I I got a note from Zoom that our time's uh, up is is nearly there. So if at any time the meeting has ended, I will restart with the same ID, the same meeting, and all everyone can rejoin again. This is just a hint about the time. Yes, continue, Professor Martin. So. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to speed up. So right. what we have is yeah, this is the this is a typical patient we got out of problem is the thrombolysis only thrombolysis because you have basically these two options for the proximal DVT. Is the thrombolysis, the catheter directly or a pharmacomechanical thrombectomy. And it depends on the on the cause of the thrombosis, you can make a choice. There are some of these, if there is no compression involved and the, and the DVT is very, very fresh, you can get out of the problem with a nice catheter direct to thrombosis. When you dive your catheter, uh, I use usually the multi hole catheter, it's the length of 20 centimeters, and you, you can go very easy going with, uh, with your lysis. Uh, is uh, half gram of RTPA per hour and a huge volume of fluids because you need to create the flow. That's that's the secret of the venous thrombolysis. Then you can get a nice result, like uh, like in this case, and you can just leave it without uh, without any additional uh, procedure. But what I do usually I combine. Uh, thrombolysis and pharmacomechanical thrombectomy, and especially the angiogen is giving you the option of power pulse thrombolysis, and that's what we usually do to dive the angiogen into the thrombus, uh, use the lysis, uh, macerate the thrombus, and then you just suck it out. <coughs> this is the Aspirex, this is the other friend of ours. Aspirex is a, it's a different device with a very high uh, sucking power, uh, and I like it as well, especially for massive thrombosis. It's more powerful than angiogen. It doesn't have an option for thrombolysis, but it's more, but it's more powerful suction device than the angiogen. So this is what we know about the proximal DVT: that anticoagulation doesn't prevent uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. 
uh, we know that the morbidity of post-thrombotic uh, syndrome is very significant and you have to this is the guideline from the whole societies that you have to consider endovenous intervention for iliofemoral bvp with advanced symptoms and low bleeding risk and, and uh, this is the this is how we advocate more aggressive approach for the proximal disease so why do i why do i treat these patients aggressively because it's so gratifying you know you never get this immediate uh, positive result from the patient's side with the arterial uh, diagnosis, but the patients with, uh, with a venous disease, <clears throat> they usually improve on table, and it's, it's amazing to see how fast it works, and the patients coming on morphine is, uh, with a huge edema, painful, unable to walk, and in three hours procedure, and, and they have some rest, uh, let's say 12 hours, so the next day post procedure, you can meet them walking around the corridor, smiling. That is, you know, they are not scared from pulmonary embolism anymore. Uh, because if there is no thrombus in the venous system, there is no risk of pulmonary embolism as mm -hmm. well. So they immediately uh, improve. And, uh, and uh, especially in young patients, the active patients, you decrease the risk of the post thrombotic syndrome, which is amazing. The post thrombotic syndrome. Uh, is a uh, very common sense and it comes from the basic hemodynamic law. There is obstruction proximally. <coughs> there is a high pressure dehistory. And in literature you can find the number 25 to 75%, but in my, uh, in my uh, practice, what, what I understand, all patients with proximal disease are having some kind of symptoms of, of chronic venous insufficiency. And it's a common sense because if there is obstruction in the drainage, there is always some symptoms. It's just the patients suffering from just some heaviness and swelling at the evening. They don't care about it, but uh, but all of them are suffering. Mm. And this is uh, this is from the study of Nikos uh, Labrov, who was our friend from the Venus Forum, and, uh, and he is sharing basically the very much same experience. I uh, I don't know how about you. Yes, it's the same, the same experience as uh, Nikolai's. Because if there is a huge thrombus proximally, they all are suffering from, from, from high venous pressure distally. So there is no doubt about it, and I have no doubt about the indication of yes. a more aggressive approach. Because the post-thrombotic syndrome is, is devastating. You can see this is, a, this is a lady in her 50s who was missed initially as a DVT and she developed this kind of post-thrombotic syndrome, unable to walk. Yes. This is my dear patient, <coughs> who, was a, who was a 17 years old, sustained uh, the fracture, biking his bicycle. He developed PVT, he was left alone, and he developed this kind of post-thrombotic syndrome. He was sucked from his job. He was unable to find uh, the, uh, the partner. So he was not able to establish his family. You can see this uh, venous ulcer opening and closing on and off. No. And uh, he was very desperate when he came to me with a okay. Do you like to open the floor for some question at this stage and then we continue after that? Or do you like to yeah, sure, finish? Sure, sure. Whenever you feel, whenever you, yeah. feel you can just stop me. And, okay, and no, no, it's okay. If anyone have a question, he can raise his hand and I will give access to his mic. Uh, I will start by the first question. Uh, I haven't used the tibial venous axis. Uh, so my question to you, Professor Martin, how much French size can you put through tibial vein? Uh, does it give you a good, uh, a good size French for deep venous intervention? Yeah, sure. The, the tibial veins, uh, when you do the ultrasound and you, you, dilate, you dilate them, uh, what you need is basically what you need is maximum ten French sheet, yeah, and even uh, and it's it's even ten French sheet is very rare. What I usually start with is eight French, and eight French sheet you can introduce through any tibial vein. So don't don't be hesitant. What I usually start with is six French. I do initial venography, and then uh, we. We make a plan and then I just change the sheet for eight French. Even okay. eight French sheet can be introduced through the tibial veins easy. Excellent. We have a question from uh, Dr. Muhammad Al-Mansouri. 
you can speak, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, you can ask your question. Dr. Muhammad Al Mansouri and Dr. Dr. Muhammad Oud. What are Dr. Muhammad? Uh, I have two questions. I don't know if uh, my sound is clear. Your sound? Uh, this for me. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Okay. Uh, my first question is about the public. Okay, the, I might ask my first question is about the volunteer intervention. Do you find volunteers is always possible access, even if the thrombus is extending through the volunteer yeah, vein itself? That's a this is the first question. Public tunnel access is almost always feasible, and uh, I very often introduce the sheet through the through the thrombus, so you don't expect any backflow, and uh, you have to just master the ultrasound. And whenever you see you are inside the vein, you just push the wire into the thrombus. So in, in many cases, you you just have to introduce your sheet into the thrombus itself. <laughs> what, what about the extension of the thrombus to the tibial vessels? You just leave it, you just leave it alone because your interest is not that, you know, uh, this is a good one actually you are asking. In the venous interventions in general, you don't expect the, the uh, angiologically or angiographically perfect results. What you, what you need is a hemodynamically perfect results. Uh, and it's an excellent question actually. Okay, so, my second so, question, if you don't mind. Let me, uh, let me this is because you asked perfect question to discuss you now. So what, what is the most important thing from, uh, in regard of the drainage uh, from the lower limb and in regard of the keeping the, the reconstruction of the proximal segment written is the profundal vein. It's a, it's a deep vein, it's a deep femoral vein. It's, so you can just access the popliteal, leave the thrombus there, you know, in the tibial veins, you don't care much about the tibial veins because they never cause post thrombotoxin. Your target is a proximal lesion, not a distal one. Okay, I got it. Uh, my second question, so you don't mind, uh, what about the time factor? The thrombus developed one day ago or 